there will never be nobody like you. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Okay, so um, we're going to go straight to the word. I'm so glad to see all of us at the house of God. Amen. Okay, so as we are starting, I'll kindly ask if we can change batches in this mic. Yeah. No what to do, guys. At least it, it should not be read. We're receiving a lot of feedback. So we can check if there is if there are any, or maybe we can can get others, even those those ones that we are able to find. Alright, so uh, I welcome all of us to our Saturday Miracle Sense. It's always a good time to be in the presence of God. Allow me to also welcome our online audience. Why don't we clap for them? Okay, so um, remember we talked about the five, the five days that you need if you are to to become spiritually strong. And um, let me see the hands of those that remember the five days in all honest. How many of us remember the five days we talked about? Uh, it may not be in the exact order, but at least if you remember even two, even three, please let me see your hands. Okay. So, number one, we talked about desire. Number two, we talked about what? Decision. Number three, we talked about discipline. We talked about delight. And we talked about default. default. And um, we, we, we've been tackling a number of issues. I believe our perception has really changed when it comes to what um, perfection is, is all about. Um, you know, many are the times when a theme, a theme of the year has been given. We tend to approach it in a way that we think we've gotten it. And the reason why God has been given me the messages that have been delivered to all of us, if you have observed, they have such a spiritual intensity in them. Because I don't want us to become materialistic and we forget the real thing that God wants us to get. So imagine I gave a theme, we're going to talk about uh, two weeks ago, we we're talking about the desire for, for perfection. And I know when a theme has been given, like I earlier mentioned, there are those of us that will go ahead of ourselves and we are thinking, ah, desire for perfection. But then as I began to explain, you noticed that it was all pointing us to, to God and whatever takes us away from Him is not supposed to be part of it. Um, I will deliberately skip because we talked about desire a lot I will skip the next one which is decisions because we will tackle it in one of our services uh, to come uh, the same one is already there but for today the Lord has led me to share on what I have entitled the discipline that provokes perfection. The discipline that provokes perfection or the discipline that leads to what? Perfection. As simple as that. I just want to really stick to the idea of perfection and how it can be actualized. How we can arrive at the point of perfection through discipline. Through discipline. Now, a wise man once said, discipline, not desire, determines destiny. And you know, when I came, up, when I came across that quote, it was quite confusing because we've always been talking about how important desire is. Because from time and time again, I've been emphasizing that desire determines what you acquire also. But then, this wise man said, discipline, not desire, determines 
destiny. Now, there is no contradiction with, with whatsoever we've been learning. I'm going to explain. Even when I gave you the five D's that would lead to your uh, spiritual growth, spirituality, and so much more, I said desire is very important. But desire is just an escort. Desire is the starting point. It's not the end. So when we talk about discipline, not desire, being a determining factor, for your destiny, we are not ruling away desire. We are saying your destiny is not going to be reached by you deciding alone or by you desiring alone. You need to remain disciplined. You can imagine, even Jesus, if you wanted, he would have said, You are saved. And there it, it's done. But you can imagine even when he was given signs of the end, he says, those that will endure up to the end will be saved. So there is that emphasis. Always pay attention. So discipline, not desire, determines destiny. Do you think it's true? So the problem is not that people don't desire to lose weight. But people are not disciplined to lose weight. For example, you've met people that are, are obese. People that have got obesity. you find someone complaining but they are not doing something that will lead to weight loss. you find people saying I desire to be closer to God than I was last year. But they are not disciplined enough to do what will actualize that desire in their lives. What will bring about growth? So there are many people who want to grow. There are many people who want to get money, work for them and a lot of other things but then it's not just in the desiring it's also in the discipline that will keep you and take you to a point where your desire becomes a reality I always say your dreams will remain dreams if you don't wake up. So it's not enough to just want the right things. We must do the right things. So desire is very important. Desire is a fuel. But you need discipline to keep and maintain what you have received. Glory to God. So we need to be more personal disciplined because we live in a time where a lot of people are, are in a carefree mode. So the word carefree is synonymous with the word careless. But then if, if, if you live in a carefree mode, you, you've come to a point where, how can I put it? It's more like you don't care. You don't care what they say. You don't care how they look at you. So we are in that generation where people have become careless. We live in a generation that has lost the culture of commitment, the culture of faithfulness, the culture of consistency. We live in a, uh, in a time where people are literally surviving on debts. You can imagine. We have people that will borrow and 
borrow from someone, you pay back the one they borrowed from. And get from another one, you pay back that one. That's Those are the times we are living in. Many people are not disciplined. So there is a lot of poor care among many people, poor health care, uh, poor uh, mental care, um, poor spirituality. A lot of people are struggling in many, many areas. Now you can imagine, I, I know Zambia is celebrating that. We had all the great seven passed their exams, including those that just on, uh, maybe they, they only wrote one paper and everybody passed. But now imagine what's going to happen when they go to grade 8 and they face their grade 9 exams. <laughs> That's when now you see, some parents will be saying, but teacher, what was this? It's because when all is said and done, as much, it's, a, it's a very good thing that's got advantages and disadvantages. I can tell you, one of the advantages is the fact that um, the Zambian education system if someone fails an exam, there are very few people that are actually taken back to school. So the government is also trying to avoid um, having an issue where a lot of people drop out of school. But then according to them, they are also saying, with seven exam, the exams have become irrelevant. But now I'm thinking, these are people that have been qualified for the level they're not qualified for. Glory to God. Imagine someone that struggled with, with knowing what a plateau is. And they will be learning what is matter. Those things. You know what I mean? Just to show you that we've been... Yeah, I don't remember. I think it's been many, many, many years when I was in grade 8. So many people are struggling with addictions. They are ruled by many things. So discipline in this context is also something that... Um, that we can refer to as self-control. If you have to check your dictionary, if you have to, to, to start the word discipline, it is actually synonymous with the word self-control. So if someone talks about self-control, we're talking about discipline. It's one and the same thing. Are we clear on that one? So let's start from somewhere. First Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27. I'm talking about the discipline that provokes perfection, the discipline that leads to perfection. But like a boxer, I strictly discipline my body. You see that? This is an apostle of the Lord. He didn't say the Lord disciplines my body. Now, let, let, let me go a bit ahead of myself. Some of you may be there saying, um, I want the Lord to discipline me. You have not read your Bible. The Bible says it is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the Lord. So before you expect God to discipline you, discipline yourself. Okay, so let's continue. But like a boxer, I strictly discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached the gospel to others I myself will not somehow be disqualified as I'm fit for service so now let me give you a brief background about this place and about these people so the apostle is writing to the Corinthians. These people were based in Corinth. Okay? Just like the Colossians, they were based in Colossae. Then the Ephesians were based in Ephesus. Yeah, so there is nothing like, you know, I've learned something. If you didn't know those things, we are praying for you. So now, 
Corinth was a place that was infested. Not only was this place infested, but it was also infected with a lot of immoral activities. There was a lot of paganism on top of the immoral activities. And then, some Christians in this place found themselves affected by these immoral activities, the paganism, and they began to compromise. So they also became immoral. They behaved like pagans, while it's claiming they were Christians. You know, pagans in, in simple terms, these are idol worshippers, outsiders. Immoral people, there was a lot of immorality in this place. Like someone could be involved in extra marital affairs, there was a lot of fornication. I'm sure we know the difference between adultery and fornication. Those are things that we can't be um, going back to teach. But then, for the sake of those that may not have an understanding, fornication is simply um, sex before or outside marriage. Now, adultery is, uh, refers to extramarital affairs. Okay? So now, you may be asking a question, what if it involves a married person and a non-married person? So if it involves two people, for the married person, that person has committed adultery. For the unmarried person, that person has committed what? Fornication. I hope it's clear. So now, these two letters, first and second Corinthians, were written to sort out the issues that we are going on. Immoral issues and paganism. So now, uh, Corinth is a city that is found in Greece. So what affected the Christians in this place? They didn't know whether they had their own culture or they were supposed to bend to the locational powers and temptations. Cultural beliefs and so much more. I'm sure you've gone to some places where immoral activities are normal. But Paul was trying to remind them that you are, you, you are the soul of the earth. You are the light of the world. So now, as if that was not enough, paganism and immoral activities were not the only issues in this place. There were also issues to do with uh, lawsuits or legal issues between and among God's people. Imagine Christians came to a point where they were taking each other to courts over disputes. So Paul was trying to counsel them. He was trying to show them the right way to go about these things that they were faced with. So beloved saints, when you understand the context, when you understand to who was the message delivered, when you understand the why and the content, the context as well as the concept of the message, it will be very easy for you to not misunderstand, misquote, as well as misapply the word of God. So I've given you that background so that when you are reading, for example, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11, where they were told, if there is an immoral brother among you, don't even eat with such a one. It should not confuse you because you have a background. You're, you're not the audience that he was talking to. So it's not like uh, Paul was contradicting what James was teaching or James was contradicting what Peter was teaching. You need to understand their different audiences. Are we clear on that one? So my topic this afternoon 
is one of the keys and tools that I have personally used to implement, to bring about change and growth in my life. Discipline. Self-control. Discipline. So I hope and pray that whatever I will be sharing today will be able to change and help somebody. You will not just listen to this word, but you will be able to look at your life from, from within and you ask for the grace of God that will help you to practice this word. So if you pay particular attention to the scriptures, to the word of the Lord, you will see that the Bible is very clear that all believers or children of God should maintain a life of strict discipline. Can you imagine for discipline to be one of the fruits of the Spirit? It's a very serious case. So when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, it does not just come to give you goosebumps. It does not just come to enable you to speak tongues or to help you preach better. It does not come to help you maybe Moses to play the keyboard better. It does not come to help you uh, sing better. It comes to instill discipline in your life. Proverbs 1 verse 7 quickly. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. This is a very, very common scripture that we all know. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But what do fools do? But fools despise wisdom and instruction. Now, the word instruction there, if you are to start, if you are to use even what we call the strongs, the word instruction there refers to discipline. That is why if you are to change this script, I mean, this same scripture, if you are to go to, um, if you are to read it using the Amplified, you will see where there is instruction there, there is discipline. Let me read it for you from ISV. You can give us from the Amplified. You've seen the last word. Wisdom and instruction and self-discipline. Self-discipline. It's there. Now, let me read it for you from uh, ISV, which is International Standard Version. We have it. How? This guy is a... Hey, I thought I was going to shine today. <laughs> I've been out, outshined. <laughs> yeah, so for those that might be thinking maybe I've, I've made a mistake, you can actually use... Um, you can say the light shone or the light shined. One and the same thing, okay? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. Imagine. So people who hate discipline. The Bible has given them a name, not, not, not the pastor, the Bible, the word of the Lord, the wisdom from God's word. So it is very clear that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. It does not end there. Mm -hmm. The fear of the Lord should lead to wisdom and discipline in your life. Amen. If you claim to have the fear of the Lord, then discipline is supposed to be part of your life. I've been preaching this thing. I've been telling you that the word disciple and discipline, they both come from the same root word. There is no disciple who has no discipline. So the fear of the Lord should lead to a life of discipline. Let us define the word discipline. Discipline is the practice of training people. It is the practice of training people to obey set rules or a code of behavior. Discipline is self-control. Discipline is self-control. Discipline is the order or prescribed way of behavior. Discipline is a way of doing things. Discipline
discipline is a field or area of study. That is why when, when, when you come um, across programs, let's say business administration, uh, law, uh, bachelor's education, they are called disciplines. I'm sure some of you have, uh, have come across that. They are called disciplines because discipline also refers to a field or area of study. In simple terms, we can also say uh, discipline refers to your area of specialization, your speciality. But discipline is also to train by instruction. Discipline also refers to training that corrects, training that molds, training that transforms character. That is discipline. So this is where a believer seeks to develop an attitude and attributes that will help that will help him grow and become better by the day. You are disciplined. Let's read 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 3 and 5. For this is the will of God that you be sanctified. First Thessalonians chapter 4. For this is the will of God. You see that? That you sh that you be sanctified, separated and set apart from sin. It is the will of God. That you abstain and back away from sexual immorality. It is the will of God. That you should abstain, stay away. Then the five says, "It is for me." That each of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor. That each of us should be able to discipline themselves, being available for God's purpose and separated from things that are profane. <clears throat> Give us the five. Not to be used in lust for passion like the Gentiles, the pagans, the outsiders who do not know God and are ignorant of his will. So when you connect such scriptures, you begin to understand why John tells us that whoever is born of God does not continue to sin. Because the Bible says that they that know their God will be strong and they will do exploits. It's either you are performing wonders or you are performing blunders. That is why when you are, when you are born again and you struggle to live a righteous and holy life, the question I have is what kind of a spirit have you received? Because the reason why we call him Holy Spirit it's because it comes with holiness in your life. Amen. Discipline. So discipline, also known as self-control, is one of the nine fruits of the Spirit. Give us Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. Galatians chapter 5, quickly. But the fruit that the Spirit produces in a person's life, in a believer's life, is love, joy, peace. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness. Verse 23. Gentleness and self-control. And discipline. So when the Holy Spirit comes in your life, it begins to bear that fruit. One of the things that it comes with in your life is self-control. It is your duty now to begin to exercise it, to begin to stretch yourself towards discipline so that you can stretch yourself towards perfection. Discipline is a gift from God. How many gifted people do you know? A lot. How many gifted people are godly? You discover we have some. And we have some people that are gifted but they are not godly. 
So God can give you a gift, but it's not in the gift. I also understood this when, when I read through the word of God and there was a time I was listening to a sermon by Prophet Emmanuel Makandiwa where he was talking about the giftedness of the gift. And he explained, he was saying, for example, if we say football is a gift, we can use that term loosely. If we say football is a gift, are you, are you saying God is on the pitch? I know, you, I know you can say it's a skill, but then skills are all under gifts. Now what I'm trying to show you is this. Let's go to 2 second, second Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. When he came, 2 Timothy 1, I think verse 7 or 17. I, I, I think we must have missed it somewhere. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity but of power, love, and self-discipline. So God has given us power, He's given us love, He's given us self-discipline. So if you are not disciplined, you are misrepresenting God. So discipline does not just come or fall on you. You need to cultivate. Just like, for example, the Bible has told us that but the fruit of the Spirit is this, that, and that. And one of the fruits of the Spirit is kindness. But not every believer is kind. Even if the gift, I mean, even if the fruit has come with the Holy Spirit, there are some people that will still argue with the Holy Spirit in them. The Holy Spirit is telling them, go and help this one. They say, God, me, I don't want. It's my money. That's why I said, the fact that God has given you and I this gift called discipline, it will not just be in action. It will not just work for us. We need to cultivate it. Joseph, the Lord was with him, but he never stood when Potiphar's wife was touching him. He ran away. Glory to God. So you need to cooperate with the Spirit. You need to yield yourself. You need to give yourself to the will of God. The saved life, the life of a believer, is a self-controlled life, is a disciplined life. Even the same grace that you talk about, not if you are to it's by the grace of God. Do you understand what, 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 what you mean, what you talk about? When you, when, you, when you mention grace, what is the role of grace in your life? Do you understand? Now let me show you something that probably some of you, you've seen before but you've not paid attention. Give us Titus 2. Verse 11. This is a common scripture. For the grace that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Okay? The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Now, why has this grace been given? Let's go to verse 12. Now, grace becomes your lecturer. Becomes your teacher. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age. Another version I read, the Bible says that grace teaches us to live disciplined lives, self-controlled lives. So if you are going to talk about the grace of God, you are talking about the grace that empowers you to be disciplined. Not the grace that becomes a license to sin. Mm -hmm. Grace is not an empowerment to sin. Grace is an empowerment to overcome sin. If you've received a certain kind of grace that makes you comfortable to live a life of sin, that is not the grace of God. It's the grace of the world. 
is what Franklin Jensen calls greasy grace. Instead of drawing you closer to God, it's taking you somewhere else. It teaches us to say no. It takes discipline to say no to a team that will give you good money because you don't want to offend God. It takes discipline. It takes discipline to say no to a man who wants to sponsor your school worth 90,000. And then you are just looking at, he just wants to sleep with me. It's not a big deal. It takes discipline. To say, to hell with your money. It takes discipline. But there are many people that will say, ah, it's not a big deal. I'm, I'm going to confess. It's not a big deal. I'm not the first one. Many people are doing this. So grace is not just a place that we run to when we've messed up. Grace is a place that we run to for direction before we mess up. Mm. We've misunderstood it. Mm. We've misunderstood it. Like people have taken it. Ah, the machine. The man up every day. But no, we've seen. Grace teaches us to say no to ungodliness. So if you've got a voice that is always telling you, mess up, you are going to, you are going to confess. If that is not the voice of the grace of God. It's the voice of Satan. Amen. It's an insult to continue living a life of sin even after the grace has been made available to you. It's an insult. This will also cause you to appreciate that it is God that causes you both to will and to do. If even the desire to do good things in you does not come from you, it comes from God. But the desire to do bad things that does not come from God, does it? It doesn't. So God cannot tell you to mischief. No, I feel I've, I've met of a zealous Christians that they will miss church, they will say, I'm fasting. I want to hear the Lord. I've met Christians that will say, no, the Lord has told me not to tie him where I, where I go for church. I, I tie it somewhere else. Philippians 2, verse 13. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So even when we do something good for the Lord, we should not clap for ourselves. We should still give glory to God. Can you imagine that? Even after you feel you've done your best, we should still give glory to God. Because it is the Lord who has empowered you. I remember on Sunday, Sunday was a very busy day. You know, we, we had a very, very powerful service in the morning. The church was packed. In the afternoon, the church was eh, was beyond packed. We danced. We, you know, was we, we were sweating and and we were very tired. But then, you know, when we went home, one of the things that my, uh, my wife told me, you know, that what has shocked me is that besides the long day that we've had, I still feel refreshed. I don't feel tired. There is a place where your spirit man will take over your body. Like today, let me be honest with you, I did sleep. Around three, when I was, there was something I was doing, then I, I was praying. So I went to the bedroom. The only thing I did was just to pick up a blanket and came back on my sleeping room. And now I, I continued what I was doing. And I can assure you, I've covered quite a number of things. The time I was planning to sleep, someone called me. We're coming to visit and you know the life and the house of, of a pastor. People can come anytime and it's like the day of the Lord, like a thief in the night. Someone can even knock and slow and put someone come up. You know what I mean? 
So, when I'm preaching on this, I remember both my biological and my spiritual parents that disciplined me. I don't know about you, but for me, both spiritually and physically, they were not soft on us. Mm -hmm. They were not soft on us. You can imagine that even on Alan Watea or even our senior, who bent my even our My father is the kind that the day I left his roof, I said, God, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> On a Sunday, like the man is not going to church. My biological sister is there, she can agree with me. He's not going to church, he went up. Just to come and wake you up. Bam, 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 bam. And like, if you are not waking up, it will hold you. Ah, ah. You can't. Ah. Passage, you touch it on church. Until you are up. They even put water for you. Some of you might, might, might think I was not but no. My father is a tough man. But he's a very good man. My spiritual father, you are from having a meeting where you have over two, three hundred people in attendance, and the following day you go, we are meeting in a classroom, and he makes you stand. George, what did you have to stand with? You have to stand at the moment of what you have to do. You have to stand at the moment of what And he's telling you that in front of everybody. Without getting offense, you are saying, Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Even if what he tells you offends you. Even Jesus said, blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Can you imagine? John the Baptist was offended also. But Jesus said, blessed is the one who is not offended by me. There is a place where John, if I, even if I tell you something offensive, don't get offended. And the blessing will come on your life. The moment you get offended with your spiritual leaders, you might be attracting the case of your life. You may not have the approach, but you should see the place of love where the rebuke is coming from. Imagine I'm rebuking you, Joseph, for not reading the Bible. Are you reading the Bible for me? And you, you get upset. No, he was rebuking me. After all, it's, it's my life. No, it's for your own good. No. So many people lack discipline. When it comes to handling money, relationships, marriages, businesses, jobs, a lot of things. Proverbs 25, verse 28. The Bible says, a person without self-control is like a city with broken down walls. Now let's read it from this version. Can you imagine? A person without discipline is like a city with broken down walls. People who cannot control themselves are like cities without walls to protect them. Was that the message I was reading? Let's just check the message. It had something to do with windows and doors. <laughs> you can imagine. A person without self-control is like a house with, with its doors and windows knocked out. So if you have no self-control, your life is on the open. You are exposed to danger. Can you imagine? If you've got no self-control, anything can happen to you any time. You are exposed. Any attack. Like, I, I, I talked to John and Bruce last week. We sat. I think that ended up being a mentorship class. I told them I don't, at a level where I've reached, I don't need to pray for or against witches. I just need to have an atmosphere that keeps them away. You get my point, eh? But then, imagine you're a believer all the time. And then, ah, Busan, attack you, attack. 
Maintenant, on va m'attaquer sur mon amour, je ne vais pas ici. Non. Sometimes we get to wonder, no. How can someone attack the life of God? The fullness of God. The name of Jesus. The presence of God. The glory of God. The cupboard. How? Now, a person without self-control is like a house with its doors and windows knocked out. What a new mama do a baby. So we can picture ourselves if we are going to live a life that is lacking discipline. Ah, we are going to be talking about how we are going to be talking about how that will become your lifestyle. Let me tell you one thing. There is no glory in being attacked by Satan. It only shows there is an open door. So don't, don't think that there is a lot of misunderstanding in, in, in the Pentecostal. People think you, you know the higher you go. Huh? You will be attacked. It's like it's like we, we, we enlarge, we magnify attacks more than the presence of God. And yet the Bible says you are more than conquerors. Greater is the one in you. Amen. There have been many times, just like this morning, I think around two. Uh-huh. I'm reading my Bible and I'm listening to worship. You hear some crazy sounds outside. I'm not going to stop what I'm doing and start getting water. Blood of Jesus. No, no, I'll just continue what I'm doing. Glory to God. Let me also challenge you. If the devil gives you prayer point, then you are not glory. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's why there are many people that are always waiting. They wake up zero to just to fight the devil. Zero zero four. <laughs> I'm just you know that there are times when when I just wake up, I want to pray nothing to pray for. I'll just listen to, to worship and I'm just praying to lie on the floor. Just be saying, God, I've just come to say I love you. And I'm praying. By the time I get out of that place, discipline. So how and what does a life without discipline look like? Romans chapter 8. Verse 5 to 6. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature will always think about the kind of clothes they are going to get to see their neighbor. They always think about sinful things. The desires of the flesh, desires, the desire of, of their eyes, the pride of life have taken over. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So as believers, we need to maintain a life. We need to live a life that pleases God. First and foremost, it should be a life that pleases God. If, for example, you're always feeling bad, that maybe there is something that you have not done due to your age, you feel you've grown and you were supposed to do something by now. Why can't you just live the rest of your life for the glory of God? Instead of living the rest of your life thinking about what you were supposed to do when you were 21, maybe 19. Now the problem we 
with most people, including most of us, is that we are sure we have got power on our own to overcome sin and to overcome the devil. And that is the reason why we are always looking for solutions to cover up sin and not to deal with sin itself. Not to deal with sin itself. Dear brothers and sisters, the problem with um, is that we fail to analyze that on our own we can be overcome. We are only uh, more than conquerors through Jesus. So we need discipline and self-control. How can we achieve this discipline in our lives? Number one, self-examination. Self-instruction is important. Always check yourself. Always talk to yourself. Be honest with where you are, what you are not doing well, and look for ways on how best you can improve. Self-examination. Give yourself instructions. First Corinthians 10 verse 12. This scripture should sober us up. So anyone who thinks they are standing strong should be careful that they don't fall. The moment you feel you can spend quality time with a young lady, with a young man, in a room, just the two of you, you will feel you are holier than the Holy Spirit. <laughs> when you feel you are strong, when you feel it's not a big thing, when you say, I don't care how they see me, God looks at my heart. Anyone who thinks they are starting should be very careful that they don't fall. So now when you go to verse 13, that's where you will see the Bible now talks about temptation. But we can't just talk about this temptation aspect if we don't talk about where it comes from. So the number one thing that you need to overcome temptation is to be truthful with yourself that you're just human. Are we clear on that one? Without God, Hallelujah. I'm trying to train myself better. Sometimes we'll be going to preach in Kapiri Bosh and these places. Lamentations chapter 3 verse 4 is a very, very common scripture. Let us examine our words and test them. And let us return to the Lord. Let, let, let me tell you one of the things that really helped me with scripture memorization, scripture knowledge. I, I used to, after I am done, I read a lot of tracts. How many of you have seen tracts? Or tracts? I read a lot of them because sometimes they'll just have a topic and scriptures. You notice? Those of you that have seen tracts. So, uh, uh, maybe I'm, 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 I'm on a topic, a face, and their scriptures, for example, like Romans 10 and 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Um, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. We are saved by faith. Uh, I mean by grace through faith. You know, it is impossible to please God without faith. So I'll, I'll be reading those scriptures that now when I'm done with the topic, I'm going to close it. And I'll get a piece of faith. So I will be writing scriptures. I write them. And I will start reciting them. Then, after I recite it, I will check with what is written. If I miss it, I will go back. Let us examine our words and test them. And let us return to the Lord. I have discovered that one be in 
we don't just pay attention. Otherwise, if we paid attention to the word of God, our lives were going to change. The greatest heart that can be laid upon your life is when you allow the weight of the word of God to be on your head, to be in your life, then you are better off. Don't forget what I taught on Wednesday. Jesus said, you are clean. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. So the idea of turning to the Lord shows your in our lives. Can you imagine? It's like, it's not that we have gone astray from the Lord, but it's very easy to, to become pompous that you think you don't need to always go back to God. That's why even as a preacher, if you come to a place where you say, ah, if you must, my mom will put my visual bad. Or of Rani, I think you can buy it, my visual bad. The good news that you have no like that. Because I mean, I'm going to say that it's a dream. It's just talent. You know, it's not just about the song that you love, it's not about the scriptures that you love, it's about speaking and ministering the mind of God. Psalms 119 verse 59, the psalmist said, when I realize that I'm going astray, I turn back to obey your instructions. Jesus. When I realize I'm going astray, I turn back to obey your instructions. <laughs> so our life as believers is a life of align, alignment, realignment on a daily basis. You always have to check. Second Corinthians chapter 13, verse, verse 5. The Bible says that we should examine ourselves to see whether we are still in the face. Can you imagine that? So there is a place where you even know. So you should always examine yourself. So, like I said earlier on, we should stop assuming we have the power to conquer sin. We need to ask for the help of the Lord. Now let's move on. You need to also develop daily spiritual disciplines that will become your regular exercises if you are to remain disciplined. Now, by daily spiritual disciplines, I'm referring to things that will draw you closer to God. Things that will cause you to grow. Imagine if the word of God is important. You will now understand the reason why God told Joshua to not let this book of the Lord depart. So there are some that have received the word, but the word departed. So you need to always read the word, meditate on the word of God, always pray, always serve, always give and be committed to fellowship. Those spiritual disciplines will help you to stand strong. Now let's move on. Prayer. What do I mean? First Peter 4 verse 7. Quickly. The end of the world is coming soon. Therefore, be earnest and disciplined in your prayers. I know a Christian Yes, we pray. But how many of us are disciplined in our prayers? The end of the world is coming soon. So one of the things that will show we are ready for the last days is our discipline in the place of prayer. Therefore, be earnest and disciplined in your prayers. Even Jesus said, pray and watch lest you enter into Psalms 19 verse 9. The other discipline that we need is the word of God. How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping watch on himself according to your word. Confirming, confirming his life to your precepts. How can a young man live a disciplined life? By living according to the word of God. By living according to the word of God. So the word of God is a reminder 
of what is expected of you if you are to live a disciplined life. What about fellowship? Hebrews 10 25. We must not quit meeting together as some are doing. Imagine. But you have anyone now less when I'm church. The Bible boy said, You don't quit like them. It's the word of God. When you quit, you become like them. We must not. Meaning, coming to church, fellowship is a command, not an option. Another version I read actually says, Do not forsake. We must not quit meeting together as some are doing. No. We need to keep on encouraging each other. This becomes more and more important as you see the day getting closer. So one of the things that will prepare you for the day of the Lord, for the coming of Jesus, is when you are committed to fellowship. And now that's why you see there is an agenda in the world. They want to close down the church. They are going against this. But you know what? The Bible says, Jesus actually said in Matthew chapter 16 verse 18. Or 18 verse 16. You are Peter on this rock. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. So now what about what about service? I don't know about you but I, I, I read the scripture where Jesus said occupy work till I return. Imagine work occupy. Another version says do business. <laughs> That's why he says, keep working while it's it what? It's day. The night will come when people will not work. So the time to save is now. What about giving? We need to give to the less privileged. Don't forget Jesus said when he was asked, Master, when did we see you naked? When were you hungry? And he said, Whatever you did for the least of these, you did for me. So as you have been a blessing to the less privileged, as you have been a blessing even to your own family, you are fulfilling your service to God. As you are giving towards the work of God, the workers, you are fulfilling the will of God. Then the other thing that you need, if you are to remain disciplined in your life, your body needs to know who is boss. You need to tell the body what to do, not receiving instructions from your body concerning what you need to do. Imagine if, 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 if the pastor just decided to say, I'm going to stop giving because people are not giving. Because people take it to that. Kind of a person. You've heard, you've heard such. Some of you have even said those things. We know. We know. Always uh, ask for the Lord's forgiveness. Kind of a person. Soon as you can say that I'm a person. Now look at this. If giving was that is. Psalms was not going to tell us that they that sow in tears will reap in joy. So meaning there is a place where you just have to give outside convenience. You've never been with a pastor around you that will get what, what you wanted and give it to somebody else that you, you, you felt never deserved it. How many have been there? You know, sometimes when we've been with men of God, I think that's why they raised us a certain way. The last money we have to use for transport, the man of God gets it. No, because they can't win and look up at Iwe Iwe. Now, I'm so that Iwe Iwe, you tend to take our hands. How many men have been there? Like, we'll be doing that to some of you. Just train me a certain way. We even know, like, you're the one that really needs a bus. 
Ya se, pues vamos a mirar a la cuerda acá. Oh, Ari. ¿Qué tal? Me dijo, ¿qué tal? Ari. Ah, me voy a hacer. Ah, me voy a hacer. Me voy a hacer. We are training you a certain way. Discipline is very important. So your body needs to know who is boss. It's not always that you feel like going to church. Because your service to God is not based on emotions, but your relationship with God. It's not every time that you feel like praying. But you will pray because you are fulfilling a duty. That is why when you come to pray, there is a place where you just say, God, I don't know. I don't have what to say. I've just come to pray. Is, is it not written in the word of God that before you pray, before you ask, I will answer. Because sometimes God does not want to hear your word. He just wants your heart. Then he will answer what your mouth has not spoken. Because God will get prayers from your heart. But then the problem is, but what we remember God will come back the Lord and my even God understands. It's very, very sad. It's very, very, very sad that we don't value what God has given us. So if you want to remain disciplined, tell your body who is boss. Now imagine, like I, I gave a practical example. If I just said, okay, today I'm very tired. Now my boss, I just go to church. Go and tell people that today you will just worship. Uh, uh, I want to rest. How are you going to take it? You take it. I need to rest. Hallelujah. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about self-denial. This is where your body wants something else. But the will of God desires something else. Self what? Self-denial. Now, self-denial is where some of you when you are fasting, you actually power up and keep food. Go and read Isaiah 58. When God was saying, is this not the kind of fast I need? To get food and give to those who don't have. We were back with us. Ah, yeah. We've been there. Capreka. One meal. Breakfast, lunch, supper. One meal. I know some of us still do this. But we've come to a place where my wife can bear me witness. We don't even cook food in advance. When we are fasting, we are fasting. We are done. Maybe when it's, it's after the it's after we are done with the drink, we start saying, okay, maybe let's look for, let's make plans. What are we going to eat? Because the problem with keeping food is that these people hold on me with their hearts, I mean with their mouths, but their hearts and their minds are in the fridge. They're just thinking, hey, tell me, Jay, that cake you see. That's the danger. Mm. Self what? Denial. You even know I need this food, but there is someone who needs it more. Now she up and I remember one time. Some mountain. But where are the and then you're thinking, okay, if, if, if I was fasting to seek the Lord, then fasting was even supposed to take away that bad attitude. I said, but but in charge fasting, see which young was I in Napoche, mommy, was I on Napoche, and at the end of the day, museum will not benefit. Because fasting does not change God. It changes you. Amen. Now, let me also tell you something that we say. We say, God, I want to have more, more of you. Those are just grammatical errors. But actually, God, through your fasting, God needs to have more of you. 
Let me say it again. When you're fasting, it changes you, not changing God. So you are giving more of yourself to God, not getting more of God. Glory to God. So self-denial. Proverbs 25 verse 16. Now this scripture is going to bless you. I'll, I'll be done very soon. Let me just share this. Proverbs 25 verse 16. There is a question. Do you like honey? Let me see your hands. So there are even, there are even some people who don't like honey in this place. But you can do something now. Okay. May the Lord be with you. Just like those of you that don't like jam, what is wrong with you? Those of you don't like pork, don't like pork, what is wrong with you? I will understand if you don't like things like me. Well, I understand. <laughs> so you can tell that it's a battle of preferences. Do you like honey? Don't eat too much or it will make you sick. Something that you've never heard. I'm not going to Ask Mr. Mother to give us a 17 or not like it. Okay, just go there then. First, first, go back to this. Don't visit your neighbors too often or you will wear out your welcome. Okay, let's go back to <laughs> That's a topic for that. Do you like honey? Don't eat too much or it will make you sick. Honey is sweet. But if you take too much of it, it can cause you to vomit. It can cause you to become sick. Food is very important. But the same food that is important for your body is able to make your body sick. Why is it that we've got diabetes? It's because they'll tell you it's, it's got something to do with sugar levels. And other diseases. They'll tell you no, protein levels are high, they are, they are low, uh, reduce this, what, what. Now imagine the food you enjoy is able to give you problems. Don't eat too much honey or it will make you sick. Now, there is nothing wrong with food. But if you don't regulate the intake of food, the same food that is supposed to be a blessing can be a curse in your body. Just like water is very important. You cannot just wankar at like a 20 liter but design my own and wrap it. You get sick. Uma manzi. Uta chizwezi wa chisida. Uma chizwezi wa chisida. Mamba 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 chizwezi been killed because they administered a lot of uh, water. You know, they have injected a lot of water in their system. Now, um, nothing. There is nothing wrong with food. There is nothing wrong with honey. There is nothing wrong with water. But if it is taken in excess, what is supposed to be a blessing can become what a curse. What's my point? Discipline will require you to know what is good for you. 
Not everything that is enjoyable is godly. Not everything that is good is right. Not everything that is right to you is right to God. So we must learn to put boundaries in and around our lives. We must know what is going to benefit us. It's not about preference. It's about the will of God. Some of you cannot learn and grow because you are saying, in the name of God, you might end up missing the will of God. Not everything good is godly. I'm saying it again. Not everything is in uh, that is enjoyable and satisfying. Not everything nice is right. Not everything that is right to us is right to God. Proverbs 14 verse 12 which is also Proverbs 16 verse 25. There is a way that seems right to man. Can you imagine that? There is a path before each person that seems right. But that same path can lead to what? So it's not about what looks okay to you. There are some people who are going to come back in a sitting area and so on and so on. So back and call them a weep. No, you've missed. You've missed it. You've missed it. Let's read what Paul said. First Corinthians six, verse twelve. You say, I am allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. And even though I am allowed to do anything, I must not become a slave to anything. You are allowed. You are allowed to do anything. You are allowed to do anything you want in this life. You are allowed. But this is a scripture that tells us everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Even though I am allowed to do anything, I must not become a slave to anything. When we live in this world, we are placed to become an example. We are, we are to become slaves to Christ in this world. Slaves to Christ. Acts chapter 5 verse 29. The apostles said, it is better to please God than to please man. Mm. There is a place where your pleasing of God will offend man. Amen. It is better God is pleased than man is offended. Than for man to be pleased than God is offended. Because we will do that way to heaven. Hallelujah. My member is improving by the day. A lot of people are living in this life. They have compromised their values. Because they want to fit in. They want to look cool. They want to be accepted. We were not created to fit in. We were not created to be accepted. We were created to be a light that will shine in this world. Matthew 16, verse 24. Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. One of the qualifications for us to come to Jesus is self what? Self what? Self deny. Beloved, this is where <laughs> this is where you know as a woman I know my mama condemned as mine. We don't cheat to carry points. As my mama, sometimes when we don't show up, we to carry pizza. No comment. Or on the car, so I'm going to piano. Yes, for me. That's how much they, they. I wish it was written that chores will take them to heaven. But now look at this. There is a place where you know I need to wash. I need to sweep. I'm not saying you become dead. But you say, you know what? This can wait. My relationship with God can't wait. You can say, uh-uh. 
Jesus needs to wash my heart. But the problem is, we value so much with the purpose of our Deny yourself. You even when you feel very tired, and that you feel like you're going to go, you may feel like you're going to go, you observe that you may not be there when you wake up. But you put that power when you're going to wake up. It is because when you tell yourself that you are not going to be able to do it, you are not going to be able to do it. Now, imagine I, I was even telling someone that if every time we are true, we miss the church, who was going to preach? Even when I can feel it, I'm not taking a coffee. Huh? Market we end up. Market. So you should have no job. You are full of excuses. Whoever wants to follow me must deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. Self denial. Your body is telling you you are tired. But you know, the Bible says God will take away happiness and is going to give you praise. And he says, I'm going to take this burden away. I'm going to give you rest. For my burden is what? Is light. Even Paul agreed with Jesus. Galatians 5.24 those who belong to Jesus Christ have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and they have crucified them there. Can you imagine? You've nailed your life. This is where you say, my life is given to God as an offering. Verse 25. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. In every what? Part of our lives. Hallelujah. In every part of our lives. Thank you, Jesus. Ah, ah, this one is okay. So we need to deny ourselves. We need to mind what comes out of our mouths if we are to remain disciplined? One of the things that show you are disciplined is your language. Are we clear on that one? Your what? Language. The last area of discipline I'm touching today is your speech. James chapter 1 verse 26. You might think you, you are a very religious person, a very godly person, but if your tongue is out of control, you are fooling yourself. Your careless talk makes your offerings to God useless. Can you imagine if, if, if they know you to have bad language and they see you praying in tongues, someone will be looking at you. <laughs> now imagine those are human beings, but you're talking about God who knows what is abundant in your heart. If your tongue is out of control, you are fooling yourself. Your careless talk makes your offerings to God useless. There is a place where if for example I'm talking to Steve and I told Steve um, yeah, Steve could you have any more than I can make a day ah, 
So, jeki na kuba hame na ime? Ah, na ima mafite kache pesa mwame ima wazi na ime. There is a place where you meet the demands. Say, oh, okay. I didn't mean to hurt you. I apologize. What are you going to do? I So it's like, I was hit. 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 You are fooling yourself. You are careless talk. So this last part is showing us that your language, your relationship with other people is able to affect your prayer life. Your prayer life. Glory to God. Mind your language. We must live a life of integrity. A life of truthfulness and faithfulness. Integrity, faithfulness, truthfulness, these are supposed to be inbuilt virtues. <laughs> By inbuilt, I mean they are supposed to be part of us. For a believer, don't clap for yourself when you say the truth. It is expected of you. In fact, get shocked when you lie. Mm. Glory to God. Mm -hmm. Live a life of integrity. Be disciplined in that area. You may need the money. You can imagine there are certain courts like that one that God gave me years, 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 years ago. This is my court, PSG courts. I would rather be poor than to have sins once again. This is where someone tells you, Iyo kandrama kabino funa ni kamuomo. Unishitile koche chaso. Orochi ya kwa teke paso za kupasa kaso. You say, you know what, I need, yes, I need that money, but there are many ways to make money, but stealing is not one of them. That's another quote God gave me. There are many ways to make it. Stealing is not one of them. It's not. Stealing is not making money. Stealing is getting somebody's money that someone has went to. So integrity is important. You cannot call yourself a believer and you are stealing from your parents. You are stealing from your husband. At what do you call that money that you find? No. A living sacrifice. Man. Eh? <laughs> Do you know why sometimes it's a gun, but not a drum? Sometimes you can't even say, ah, it's not a drum. But you can't even say, I'm not a drum. 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 So you are afraid of opening up. And yet there is someone who stole the money you had. And they are still asking, they expect me to release another money. Integrity. Integrity. It's a sin. Let no one lie to you and no. Katimamuna bezi wa kumbe na kumbe na kumbe. Kumbe na kumbe. Isaiah 33 verse 15 those who are honest and fair those who refuse to profit by fraud those who stay away from bribes can you imagine those who refuse to listen to those who plot murder those who shut their eyes to all enticement to do wrong verse 16 these are the ones who will dwell on high. The rocks of the mountains will be their fortress. Food will be splitted to them. And they will have water in abundance. 
Beloved, I've come to a point where I remember I was with my wife on, uh, I've forgotten the day, but probably it was, it was a Monday. But I don't, if not Monday, it was last week, Friday. When going into town, she went to buy some wigs. And I was getting a few things for uh, a phone accessories. So I went to get some cables. I paid for them. We had gone to another place we went. I think we spent more than 20, 30 minutes. So when we were in that other shop, I think I had opened my bag. Then the Holy Spirit convicted me to say, no, you only paid for these cables. This white one, you carried it. You didn't pay for it. So I told my wife, I said, no, 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 babe. You know what? I paid for these other cables. I, I don't remember paying for this other one. She said, but you have it in your hand. I said, I think in his nine yamuna, but you know, after Naganiza, the money I gave them was for the five cables. So I was not supposed to get this one. So we went back and I reached and I said, no, I think I paid for these cables. I carried this one by mistake. And the owner was shocked. He looked at me. I think he was asking himself, do such people still exist? Now I was I, I was telling myself, why should a 15 kwacha, why should a 20 kwacha, 12 kwacha, 10 kwacha make me miss my blessing? Do you know how much money God has given me in my life for me to miss my blessing over that? And yet some of you will be saying, the Lord who answers by fire is a living God. Uh, uh, no, no, those are not blessings. No, no. If you have been doing that, stop it. Have you observed it's very easy for a Christian to put in a bus? It is the devil tempting your faithfulness. I tell them, say, no, 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 no. Five, five quarter. No. Integrity is important. You may not know. You are doing that, number one, for your relationship with God. Now imagine that day, how I did that for myself, number one. And how I ministered. My wife didn't even pay attention what cables I paid for. It was something I knew in my heart. No one was going to catch me. But the conscience God has given me will not allow me. So I helped myself. Paul said in Romans, I see the truth. And my conscience bears witness. Number two, I also ministered to my wife in a special way. Number three, the honors. I'm sure that day, and I know what she did on my house. I'm not going to be able to do that. Hallelujah. Amen. Food will be supplied to them. They will have water in abundance. You know, you know, you know why I stopped stealing in my life years ago? Because of the principle I learned when I got born again. I noticed one of the Ten Commandments was do not steal. But then, another man of God was teaching the said, when you steal, in the spiritual realm, but there is ways of people where you are. We are actually transacting in the account of the Lord. And now we imagine you steal from someone. And they are complaining that Mandalos, God, what's happening? The tears of such people will not go unnoticed. He's a God of justice. So many people are blocking themselves because they are crooked, tongue speaking, but they are great liars. The greater talkative is a greater liar. Even my innocent. Hallelujah. And it's the Bible. It's the Bible. No, not my know. It's the Bible. If you pray in tongues and get to not have love, love for what? love for the truth, love for God, love for His people. So God is displeased when He sees His children living in sin. 
Remember in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 15, if not mistaken, before verse 18, where he said, Come and let us what? Resort together. Before he invited them, in verse 15, he was saying, If you lift up your hands to pray, I'm not going to listen to you because your hands are full of blood. Full of blood. So Proverbs 12 verse 1, whoever loves to learn, loves discipline. If you love to learn like, like this, discipline is coming to your life. So you are becoming better. Amen. Whoever loves to learn, loves, whoever loves discipline, loves to learn. Whoever loves to learn, loves discipline. Now, we can rise to our feet. There are people that have not been able to discipline themselves. It seems like the Lord has been disciplining you. When I'm not even able to divorce you, I said, I'm not going to go, ah, I think you will manage the discipline. But now let me tell you, the discipline of God is the purpose of His love for you. You can give us a last scripture, Mr. Wiser. Hebrews 12. Let's read it together. <laughs> Let God train you. Let God train you. See that? For he is doing what any loving father does for his children. For example, when you are listening to the word of God, no, I'm going to make a prick of the prick of the prick of the prick of the prick You should know that God is training you. He loves you. He wants you to become better. Whoever heard of a son who was never corrected? Who has ever heard of a child? Let me, let me see someone who has never been rebuked by his or her parents in this place. Let me see your hands. Who has been rebuked? That's what the Bible is talking about. Let's go to verse 8. If God doesn't punish you, discipline you when you need it, as other fathers punish their sons, then it means that you are not really God's son at all. That you don't really belong to. I belong in his family. So if you have even a spiritual leader who never rebukes you, just for maybe they don't consider you as their son. Let's go through. Verse 9. Since we respect our fathers here on earth, though they punish us, they discipline us, should we not all the more cheerfully, joyfully submit to God's training, God's discipline, so that we can begin, so that we can begin really to live? Give us verse 10. Our fathers on earth trained us for a few brief years, doing the best for us that they knew how. But God's correction is always right and for our best good that we may share His holiness. The last verse. Being punished, being disciplined isn't enjoyable while it is happening. It hurts. But afterwards, we can see the result a quiet growth in grace and character. The discipline that leads to perfection. So be disciplined. Allow the word of God to discipline you. Sometimes when you are reading the word of God, you must be able to get rebuked to say, mm. so this is how I've been taking God. No, I'm going to follow this word. I'm going to obey God. When you hear the word of God, do not become personal with the man of God, but get to appreciate the revelation. Sometimes even if you don't like it, it's for your own good. Our teachers at school, Sometimes they say, Shitaso, shitaso. Now, God. But at the end of the day, you can't tell me, if you are still holding grudges, then, sorry to say this, to a larger extent, you might be a fool. Because no matter what they did, some of you, over the years, you've come to appreciate the discipline they instilled in you. I know some of them were just trying to be, to be difficult for nothing. There, there, there are some teachers who are bullies. But then I'm talking about those that loved you. Sometimes they even tell, uh, told you, I'm doing this because I love you. One day you will grow and you will appreciate this. Sometimes you look back and just say, ah, 
Nesiche wachongo na hine And you appreciate How that has helped you I want you to thank God for the word I know we have taken some bit of time But I wanted us to Just make this We appreciate God for the word And I want you to pray and say God Help me To have divine Self-discipline in my life Open up your mouth and begin to pray In the mighty name of Jesus we worship you, God. What is it? Thank you for your word. Thank you for speaking to us. We are not the same, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you have ministered to us. Lord, may you help us in the name of Jesus. We pray for the discipline of life. We shall not just stop things. We shall desire. We shall also be disciplined. We shall start and we shall remain disciplined. In the name of Jesus. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. May you help us. Teach us, Lord. Teach us, Lord. Teach us, O Lord. May you teach us. Help us, O Lord. Help us, O Lord. Father, help us. Help us, O Lord.
to go astray with Jesus. The Lord is with you. The Lord will watch over you in the mighty name of Jesus. You are going to be disciplined in your words. Disciplined. In prayer. Disciplined. When it comes to fellowship other and other areas of your life. In the mighty name of Jesus. May the Lord be with you. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen and amen.